Hello and welcome to the Roland VS880 Video Owner's Manual. Now during the course of the tape I'm going to show you just about everything you need to know in order to get up and running quickly and efficiently. I'll be describing the operation of the expanded version of the VS880, but if you happen to have one of the older pre-expanded versions, don't worry because most of the sections will relate to your machine as well as the expanded version of the machine. Okay, we're also going to take a detailed look at the effects board, which is optional. Now, if you have one of the earlier machines, I strongly advise you to check out the expansion kit, the VS880S1, as for next to nothing, you can expand your machine to give you all of the latest features. Okay, without further ado, let's uh, take an overview. The VS880 is a fully self-contained digital recording studio in a box, and it consists of three main parts. Firstly, the digital mixer section, offering up to 14 input channels. It also contains very sophisticated equalization, and it can be fully automated upon mix down. The 64-track recorder and editor functions just like a, a conventional multi-track tape recorder, familiar transport controls and so on, very, very easy operation. And last but not least, the built-in effects processor, offering two stereo effects processors on a board. Combining these three elements gives us total control over the various processes involved in music production, recording, editing, mix down, and so on. Before we do anything else, let's take a brief look at the back panel and check out the various connections that can be made. OK, well, starting on this side, we see four jack inputs. These are the inputs that we use when recording, and the VS880 is able to record up to four tracks at a time. These inputs are duplicated over here on phono connectors. So for your convenience, you can choose to use jack or phono. Down here, we have the master outputs, left and right. This is where you hook into your amplification system. And over here, we see aux send A and B. Well, you can think of the aux send bus as being exactly the same as the, the main mix bus. It's just an alternative. And you can set up a submix or alternative mix output from these sockets. Next, we have the headphone output followed by the foot switch input. We can set up a foot switch to do various functions like uh, start, stop, drop into record, tap markers, and so on, all assignable. Then we see the standard SPDIF digital in and out. These can be used for importing audio from CD or DAT. We can also use them when mastering to DAT. Okay? They also function to serve as DAT backup in and out. So if we need to store projects, we can store directly to DAT. And rather than recording audio, what is recorded is the program information. OK? Over here, we see MIDI in and out. Well, we can use MIDI to control the internal effects processor parameters in real time. We can use an external sequencer to perform CompuMix. That is, when we mix down, we can automate the effect of the faders, pan, effects, and so on using an external MIDI sequencer. We also use the MIDI in and out sockets to synchronize the VS880 to maybe another VS880 or to an external sequencer. And over here we see the SCSI port. SCSI stands for Small Computer Systems Interface. Now, this machine happens to incorporate a standard IDE drive, in this case 850 megabytes of storage. This is where I store my songs and all of the data I record into the machine is stored directly to this drive. Alternatively, I could use an external SCSI device, such as a zip drive, something like that. OK? And finally, over here, we have the power switch and mains inlet. So that's the back panel. Now, you may have purchased the packaged version of the VS880 Expanded, which incorporates the effects board plus an internal IDE drive. Now, if you have this package, you'll find that the drive already contains a demonstration song. If you don't have the demonstration song, don't worry, as later on I'll be showing you how to record your own data into the machine. But for the, the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to switch on and load up the demo tune. Well, let's take a look at the display as I do this. You'll see a boot-up routine, Roland VS880. First thing that's shown is the software version number, in this case 2.04. The machine then performs a SCSI scan which is designed to detect whether I have any external SCSI devices connected. Then 
the VS-880 loads the last song that was being worked on. And then it initializes the effects board. And we come to rest in the play mode. Now, in order to load any song from the drive, we first need to look at the edit condition buttons over here. The one on the end is marked song, and underneath the button, you'll see a listing of the functions available. To access any one of these functions, we simply press the song button as many times as we need to move down the list of functions. So for example, song erase, press the button five times, and you'll see the display shows that particular function. So let's move all the way around. It simply scrolls round and round and round. We're going to find song select as a question mark. Whenever we see a question mark, we're being asked to confirm selection. And to do that, we press the button over here marked yes or enter. The screen tells us select initialized song number one. Well, I don't want that. I'm going to go and find my demonstration tune, which is called vStudio. I then press enter once more, and it says song select sure. Well, I'll reconfirm by pressing enter. And then it says store current. This is simply a safety measure. It's basically saying, do I want to store what I've been working on up till now so that when I reload a new song, I don't erase what I've been working on? Well, since I haven't been working on anything up to this point, I'm going to press no. And then the VS-880 loads up the song. So I've loaded my demo tune. Now, don't worry if your demo tune is different from mine in any way, because it will still respond to the controls in exactly the same way. So let's have a listen. Down to our transport controls here, very familiar tape recorder-like controls. Make sure we're at the beginning, press this button, which is return to zero. That takes us to the, the front of the track. Then hit play and have a listen. Before we look at the basic mixer operations, let's first consider the mixer mode. Now, up here, you can see on my unit, an LED is flashing. This shows me that I'm in auto mix, which means that as I've been playing back the track, the track has been following an automated mix down. Well, for us to mess around, we want to switch this off. And to do that, we go to Scene, hold the button down, and at the same time, press Select. The LED stops flashing, which shows us that we're now out of auto mix mode, and the display confirmed that at the time. OK. We also have different ways to configure the mixer, and I want to make sure that you're in the same configuration that I am. This configuration is called input track, which means the eight tracks are played back through the eight mixer channels in correspondence, so that track one plays back through channel one, track two through channel two, and so on. The most basic configuration, if you like. But by holding down shift select, you can switch to another mode entirely. Input mix track mix. These are two separate views of a larger configuration, which is effectively 14 channels. We tend to use this when we're mixing down, so we're not going to talk about it now. We'll come on to this later on. So back to the basic input track mode. Shift, select. Now, before we start messing around with the song, let's take a closer look at the display. What exactly does it tell us? Well, in the top left-hand corner, you can see PLY. That means that the condition of the VS-880 at this point is playback. Underneath this, we see the position through the song in terms of beats and measures. Underneath, INT stands for internal synchronization. If we're hooking up to another VS-880 or an external MIDI sequencer, we would set this up to show EXT, external sync. Next to that, we have the scene number. Now, don't worry about scenes at this point, as we'll be discussing them later on. And underneath this, we have the remaining recording time available in track minutes, which means if I was to record on one track, I would end up with 336 minutes of available recording time. At the top here, we see a time code readout in terms of hours, minutes, seconds, frames, and subframes. And finally, over here, we have a bar graph metering of each of the tracks in the song. And we can see here, at the moment, track three is playing on its own. It's just been joined by track five, the acoustic guitar. Over here, the output is shown. And as I bring it down, you can see the bar graph diminishes. Now, as with all digital systems, it's important that we do not exceed the maximum signal level, which is zero dBs. 
otherwise digital distortion may occur. Now, over here in the edit condition area, we see a button marked play. Now, underneath the word play, we see another word display, and it's shown in a box. This means it's a shift operation. So by holding down the button mark shift and display, we can scroll through various display options. You can see there. Well, the first one is pre-level, and the display shows us the level of the sound coming off the disc. In other words, before it goes through the fader. Alternatively, we can view it post-fade. So on track one, the metering shows the signal level drop as I pull down the fader. We can also look at the playlist, which is a representation horizontally of the material available on each track. And the tracks are shown like this. One, two, three, four, five, and so on. And you can see we're coming to the end of the song here. If I take it back to the beginning, you can see the display shows a different range of available material from each track. And then finally, we have the fader pan display. This is a, a graphical representation of the internal position of each of the faders and pan pots within the mixer section. Now, the reason we have this display is because there are some situations where the physical position of the fader or pan pot may be different from the internal values for the same. OK, and as I pull down the fader, you can see the, the virtual fader position changes. Or with the pan pot, a small vertical line moves either up or down, indicating left or right pan. OK, well, that's the display. As the tune is playing back, we can change the relative balance of the individual tracks within the song. Using the level faders here, I can take back the overall level, that's the master mixer output, or the level of each of the individual tracks. So let's pull them all out, isolating just the vocal on one. Let's put in the drums, seven and eight is the kit. Add a bit of bass on six. Acoustic guitars on five. And there's an electric guitar part on four. Organ on three. And the harmonica comes in on two. Well, if I want to, I can mute the individual tracks using the status buttons here. So rather than using the fader, I can switch the track on and off instantaneously. Take out the drums, and so on. Alternatively, I could solo each track so that by pressing just one button, I can switch off all of the remaining tracks. Now, to go into solo mode, we have to hold down Shift and this button here marked Solo. That switches solo mode on, but it won't do anything until we isolate one of the tracks. Track seven on its own, just by pressing one button. Vocal on its own. Organ. And so on. Come out of solo mode just by pressing Shift Solo once more. We can also apply individual pan per track. So let's, I don't know, let's pull out the, uh, all the tracks apart from three. I can now take this control and pan left and right. Now, the recording's in mono, so you won't hear this, but I'm getting a shift between left and right speakers. Hard disk recording systems such as the VS880 have an interesting property known as random access. And it means that we can move to any point within a song in no time at all. No fast forward or rewind times. Let's start playback. Now, at any point, I can hit the button marked zero, and instantaneously, we'll move to the beginning of the song. Bar one, measure one. The fast forward and rewind controls are designed to emulate those found on analog tape machines, in that when you hold them down, they start moving slowly and gradually speed up. So they feel instantly familiar. Rewind is the same. The transport controls have secondary functions as well. You can see here, by shifting, we can access store, song top, song end, shut, eject, and so on. So song top will take us to the beginning of the recording, song end to the end of the recording. Not necessarily the end of the song, just where the recorded material is. OK. Well, moving through the song in a different way, we can use the time value dial over here. You can see in the display that the measure indicator is flashing. And I can scroll directly, changing the measure position. If I want to move more swiftly, I can hold down shift at the same time. And you can see then we move in groups of 10 measures. Now, I'm altering the measure position because that happens to be the 
the area of the screen that's flashing. But using the cursor controls here, I can change that, and I can cause the beat indicator to flash, thereby moving through the various beats. And by the same token, hours, minutes, seconds, and so on. I can move to the time display. So I can change the resolution of movement. OK. Just like an analog tape machine, it's possible to vary the playback speed. This is called vary pitch, and the button's found over here. So try playing back the track. Press vary pitch once. It lights, but nothing happens. Well, that's because the, the playback pitch is set to be the same as the nominal playback pitch. To change it, we hold down shift plus vary pitch, and the display will show a sampling frequency. Well, this can be reduced to lower the playback speed or increase to speed it up. Once again, get rid of it by pressing the button. It's quite a handy feature. If you're trying to sing backing vocals, you can't quite reach the notes. Just tune the whole track down, sing away, then speed it back up. Or it's also handy for tuning the VS-880 to other instruments that cannot be tuned, maybe an old piano or something. Now, the VS-880 has 32 positional flags which can be dropped at any point during playback. They're called locate points, and they're found down here in the locator section. Now, if I press the button marked lock one, a time location is captured instantaneously. And if I press the button again, we move straight back to that point. Same with locate two. Now, these locate points are useful when designating areas for editing, or maybe when used to mark out the beginning and end of sections within a song, like choruses and verses. They can be cleared by holding down the button marked clear at the same time. And so on. Now, four locate points are available here, but by pressing down shift, we can access four more. And by changing the locate bank up here, we can access four more banks, giving a total of 32 locate points. Now, in addition to the locate points, we also have 1,000 markers available. And a button here marked tap allows the dropping of markers on the fly. So let's start the track again. And this time, instead of using the locate points, I'm going to drop markers using the tap button. And you can see the display shows the marker number. Every time I press tap, I drop a new marker. I can then use these buttons, previous and next, to move through the various markers assigned much like the index points on a DAT machine. Well, I tend to use the marker points to denote the beginning and end of choruses, verses, middle eights, and so on, and the locate points for editing purposes, as I'll show you a bit later on. We can use two locate points in conjunction with the loop function here to give us a looped playback, which is very handy for rehearsal purposes. OK, this is how we do it. Let's start playback. Drop down your first locate point where you'd like the loop point to start. Let's try it here. Drop the second where you wish the loop to end. OK, there are the two loop points. Stop the track. Now, whilst holding down the button marked loop, press locate 1 followed by locate 2 without releasing the loop button. And it means those two points have been loaded into the loop memory. Now pressing the loop button will illuminate the LED, and playback will resume from locate one, and loop around to locate two, and then back again. And you can hear that. It's not a seamless loop. If we need to create seamless loops, then we have to do it as part of an edit, which we're going to look at soon. The VS-880 mixer section looks, from the face of it, very, very simple. However, it's every bit as sophisticated as some of the bigger desks. Instead of having separate controls for EQ and AUX send and routing and so on, we find these parameters contained within the channel edit buttons on each strip. So if we want to access EQ, for example, we have to use shift operations. Now you can see, underneath each of the channel edit buttons is, once again, a boxed function. This one, for example, says EQ mid. Now, supposing I wanted to access the equalizer for
4, channel 4. This is what I do. Shift, EQ mid, take my hand off shift, and now press the channel edit button on strip 4. And the display shows me for channel 4, EQ mid has been selected. And the display shows me the EQ curve for that channel. Let's try something else. Supposing I wanted to access the effect 1 parameters on channel 2. Shift, effect 1, channel 2. So it's a simple two-stage operation to access any of the parameters. This is the quick way of doing it. If you're a bit confused by that, all you have to do is use these buttons here marked parameter left and right, and you can access all of the mixer parameters for each channel independently simply by moving left or right. So it's a very neat way of bringing all those different parameters together, a truly powerful mixer. Well, let's take a more detailed look at the EQ now. I'm going to try and EQ, or tone shape, the drum part. So let's pull out all of the faders except for 7 and 8. Now, this is a stereo pair. The drums have been recorded left and right into 7 and 8. So the first thing I want to do in order to make my EQ changes affect both channels at the same time is link the two channels. We can think of these as channels 1 to 8 or as stereo pairs A, B, C and D. So I'm going to set up for 7 and 8 to be linked into a stereo pair D. And to do that, I go Shift, Aux Send. For channel 8, I'm going to move one step to the right, and I find something called Channel Link. For channel 7, Channel Link is off. If I switch it to on, we now end up with channel D. So the unit is automatically treating 7 and 8 as a stereo pair D. OK, well now I can go straight to my EQ. So Shift, EQ Mid. And channel D, and I can create the necessary boost or cut within various frequency regions. Now, the EQ is very, very powerful. We have three frequency bands, a low, a high, and a mid, which is true parametric mid. It means we can adjust the frequency at which either boost or cut is applied, and also the bandwidth of that cut or boost. It means we can home in on very specific frequencies, maybe just getting rid of some hum that we have in the recording or boosting a certain range of frequencies that are characteristic to that instrument. The idea with EQ is that we try and separate the instruments of a recording, giving them their own special frequency band. That way, giving us the greatest separation. OK, well, let's try it on the drums. There we go, the drums playing back on their own. I'm going to boost the mid frequency, and you can hear the boost there. Cut, boost. If I scroll one step to the right, I can access the parameter for that boost. Sweeping up and down. Now let me change the bandwidth of the boost. Using the cursor right control, I can increase the Q factor of the filter all the way to 16. Now if you listen, if I sweep it, you should hear a much more clearly defined region of boost. Almost like a phaser. And I can boost and cut plus or minus 12 dBs. So I can build up very, very complicated EQ curves by combining the boost in the mid-range with a high boost, again, with a definable center frequency, and a low boost, just there. You see the EQ curve that I've created is displayed graphically. So that's how we use the EQ. And don't forget that a completely different EQ curve can be set up for each of the playback channels. Now, the VS-880 is described as having 64 tracks. Well, that's absolutely true. We've already looked at eight tracks of playback. Now, behind each of the main eight tracks, we have seven alternative tracks, making a total of 8 by 8, 64. And these are the V tracks. Well, we have a V track display. If we go to Shift, Channel Edit 2, we can view the V-track assigned to each of the main eight playback tracks. In this case, channel one is assigned to V-track one. And as we've heard, the main male vocal part for the demo tune is recorded on V-track one. Manifold choices with minimals. Well, let's go back to the beginning of the song. Now switch channel one to V-track number two. We have an alternative take for that particular part. Manifold choices. In this case, female vocals. So 
So exactly the same mix, the same EQ, the same effects and so on have been set up. I'm just switching to an alternative take. Let's try V-Track number three. Back to the same point. This time we have a narration VS instead. So the V-Tracks are very, very useful. It means we can record many, many different versions of a take and then wait till the last possible moment before deciding how we're going to mix the track together. Maybe create a composite track from each of the V-Tracks. So a guitar solo could be recorded eight times and we could take the best bits of each, put them together for the perfect take. The VS-880 offers another real advantage over the traditional analog tape-based systems. And that's when we come to edit the music. Now, just as a word processor is able to edit text using things like insert, cut, delete, erase, and copy, we can do exactly the same thing with our music. The process is non-destructive, which means having recorded data into the VS-880, we can then fiddle with it, but we'll never lose or destroy the original recorded material. All of the changes we make are temporary, if you like, and the original recording remains intact on the hard drive. Well, let's now try a simple track edit. If you look at the machine, you can see I've set the display to show the playlist display. And we can see on tracks one and two, we have a short recording. Well, it's a simple two bar drum loop. It sounds like this. Okay, well, I want to use that as the basis for a new song. So I intend to use the track copy facility to extend that drum loop as many times as I need to create the, the underlying drum track for my new tune. Well, the drum track is actually a stereo pair and I've recorded the two halves left and right on tracks one and two and panned them left and right. I'm going to edit the two together, so it's going to be easier if I can edit them in one go. And to do that, I'm going to link the two channels. So the first thing I do, shift, aux, send, and one step to the right, because that's where channel link is found. Let's set by pressing channel edit number one, channel link on for one and two, creating channel A. That's now done. Well, the pan pots can be set centrally now. Pan pot number one becomes a balance control between left, right, one and two. And this fader can now be brought down. You see here where it shows bus A. To the left we see bus, to the right we see aux. Well, this fader now controls the whole stereo pair. This fader controls the amount of signal sent to the aux bus, if you happen to be using it. So let's leave that up. Check the drum lip will still play. That's fine. Now, I've already put the drum loop to the very, very beginning of the track. So I'm going to mark the in point, if you like, of the loop by pressing locate one when at return to zero. Now, on the fly, I'll drop locate point number two at the end of the loop when I think the loop point comes about. One, two, three, four, drop. OK, so those are my two edit points, start and end. Let's go to track edit and look for track copy. Question mark, again, confirmed by pressing yes. Now it's giving me the prompt. Copy track, question mark, question mark, to, question mark, question mark. Well, this is simply which track and which V track of that track to which other track and V track. Well, I can select the source track by simply pressing the channel edit button on that track. So A1, which means track A, stereo pair A, virtual track one in this case, Yes, to confirm. Back onto itself, so A1 again. That's the selection made. Now, I could go on to make further selections here, copying at the same time tracks 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. But I don't want to. I'm just dealing with tracks 1 and 2, track A, if you like. So let's move one step to the right using the parameter controls. And it now asks for a start time. At which point do we wish to start copying data? Well, I could dial in a time code point this stage, but it's much easier just to press the locate point that I've already defined. Locate number one, and that loads in the time value for that point. Then it asks for the from point. Well, in the case of simple drum loops, the from point is always the same as the start point. I'll explain what the from point is a little bit later on. So once again, press locate button number one. Where is the end of the data to be copied? And that was locate point number two. So press locate two. Again, one step to the right, it asks, 
Where do you want to paste the copied version down to? Well, since we're trying to create a loop, a but edit, we're going to join the beginning of the copied version to the end of the original version. So the two point is going to be the same as the end point for the original. So once again, locate two. How many times would I like to copy that two-bar phrase? Well, I can copy to a maximum of 99 times. Now, this is interesting. I'm copying a two-bar drum loop 99 times, so surely that's going to use up a lot of space on my hard drive. Not at all. It's a non-destructive edit, which means each copy uses up no more space than the original. It's simply, if you like, a queue list. Track copy OK. Hit yes to confirm. And it says, now working complete. So once again, it takes no time to perform the edit. Let's have a listen and see if the loop has worked. Pretty good. It's pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Now, you'll notice down here a button marked undo. Well, having made any edit, it's possible to undo that edit if it doesn't work properly. Now, a lot of units offer this facility, one level of undo. However, you normally only realize your mistakes after subsequent editing. Well, the VS880 gets around this problem by allowing you 999 levels of undo. So, in other words, you can go back 999 edits and restore the machine to whichever condition it was in at some previous point. Fantastically useful, a bit like peeling back the layers of an onion. I've just been listening more closely to my loop. See if you can hear, there's a little glitch at the end of the loop. I think my second locate point was dropped just a little bit too late, so I need to undo this edit and try it again, moving the locate point slightly closer to the first. So uh, over to the undo button, press it once, and the display shows undo level one. Well, since I've only made one edit so far to this material, I've only got one level of undo. However, if I'd made 10 edits, then it would show 10 levels of undo, and I could choose to go back as far as I wanted. So let's press yes to confirm the undo, check the loop again, and this time we should be back to our single two-bar phrase, and the display shows this. Now, before I change the locate point, you'll notice that the undo button is now illuminated. The indicator shows that we have a redo available. Now, if I hold down shift and press undo, the display says, redo last undo, question mark. So even when you've stripped back layers of the onion, as it were, you can always put them back on again. So if you're trying to find a particular point in the edit history, you can experiment by going back a certain amount of levels. If it's not the right level, you can put all those levels back on and then go back some more levels and so on until you find the condition that you want. OK, well, I'm not going to redo last undo, so I'll press no. Now, incidentally, when you're editing, Using any of the edit condition controls, you can always escape the page that you happen to be on by pressing the play button here. This will always take you back to the main play page. So let's, uh, let's try changing my second loop point, my locate two. And we do this both by selecting locate two and then going up to the edit condition area, locator. And scroll through until you find lock two. And it will display the last selected locate point. Now, I think I was just a little bit late on that locate, so I'm going to move my cursor all the way as far right as it will go so that I'm going to be changing the locate point in a resolution of subframes. And you can see there, subframes, 51 subframes. Well, let's rotate that backwards a little way, thereby changing the, the value associated with the locate two points. And I don't have to confirm that. What I see is what I get. Press play to come out, back to the play mode, and perform the edit once more, track copy. Well, it remembers from the last edit the track selections that I made, so it saves time. I can once again define my start point, my from point, my end point, and my to point. And let's try it 99 times again. Copy, OK, done. Well, let's see if that's any better. Well, that's perfect. I'm very happy with that. So I'm going to leave that now as the, the underlying structure for my new song. Now, just one word of warning. The locate points down here, represented by these buttons, you can see that each button actually has a dual function. They are also the scene memory buttons, but they only function as scene memory buttons when the scene light is shown. So make sure when you're dropping your locate points that this light is off. 
Well, you can see from the display that I have at least 200 bars worth of drums there. And that's fine. They're exactly what I want, so I'm going to leave those. I'm going to be making quite a few other edits, though, and it would be much nicer, being a musician, if I could edit to beats and measures. Well, the display does not seem to tie up with what we're hearing at all. You can see that the, the beats and measures are moving much too slowly. Well, this is because the original drum part was recorded at a tempo of 124 beats per minute, but I know that the tempo map, the internal tempo reference for the BS-880, defaults to 120 beats per minute. So we need to speed it up somehow and get the old bars and measures to line up with the drum track. Well, to help us do this, we have a built-in metronome. So let's go and find the metronome. We need to look for system parameters, question mark, confirmed by pressing yes, and look for metronome. There we go, metronome out, and we can select whether it's internal sound or a MIDI event to be transmitted to an external MIDI device. Well, let's set it to internal. And we can also select whether we hear it when we record or play or both. We'll set it to record and play for the time being. OK. Let's start the drum loop. And if I pull down the master fader, you can hear that there's a metronome in there, which doesn't change as I change the level of the master fader. Well, it's running completely out of phase at the moment, so let's return to zero. And now we're going to go to a page marked sync. Sync tempo question mark, yes. And we're going to set the tempo map, T map one, to the correct tempo, which in this case is 124 beats per minute. Now, the reason I know this is because I removed the drum loop from a drum sample CD where all of the, the speeds, the tempos, were listed on the back. So that's fine. 124. Back to the play mode. And now the two should line up. Fantastic. So that the drums are now working in accordance with my display of measure and beat. I can then use the measure beat display for editing. Rather than using locate points or time code positions, I can simply go into my track copy, for example, and select directly the start measure, the end measure, and so on, completely ignoring the time code readout. Much, much easier way of doing things. Once again, bear in mind that in order to move through the piece of music using measures, we have to have selected measures from the cursor so that measure flashes, or beat in this case, or time code, and so on. Well, it was very easy for me to assign that loop to the tempo map, and that was because I knew the tempo of the loop. But if you're trying to fit a tempo map to something which has an unknown tempo, don't worry about it. There are various techniques we can use to, to make audio conform to a preset tempo map. One is time stretch, and the other is the ability to create a tempo map on the fly using the tap tempo facility, which we can talk about later on. Well, editing drum loops is one thing because we have a rhythmic meter to work against. But supposing you're trying to edit some dialogue, well, this is quite different, and we can approach it in a completely different way using a facility called Scrub. Now, Scrub editing traditionally involves a tape-based system. You take the left and right-hand spools of the tape machine and you rock the tape over the tape head, gradually homing in on the edit point. Well, the problem with this technique is that, by definition, as you narrow in on the edit point, the tape is slowing down, and you really lose the sense of what you're listening to. Well, the VS880 scrub works in a different way. It takes a small chunk of memory and loops it. You can then change the looped point and move through the material. Okay? This means you never lose a sense of what you're listening to. The pitch remains constant. Let me show you what I mean. A piece of dialogue here taken from the demo tune. Listening to the latest breakthrough from Roland, the VS880 Digital Studio Workstation. Well, let's suppose I want to isolate one of those words. Let's try and remove the word digital using the track cut edit. You are listening to the latest breakthrough from Roland, the VS880 Digital Studio Workstation. So in order to check that I've correctly dropped a locate point at the beginning of the word digital, I'm going to go into scrub mode. Now, first I press the button marked scrub over here, and then the channel edit button that corresponds to the track that I wish to scrub. Then by rotating the time value dial, I can move through the audio. It's 
very strange sound, but it's, it's very, very useful because you, you always get a sense of what you're listening to. You can still hear exactly what the, the voice is saying. So let's just check that edit point. The first edit point from locate one. Scrub. Backwards. Well, there's the D of digital. And I can just find the very beginning of the word. I'm going to clear locate one and drop it at that point. Stop scrub. So from there, I'll now find the end of the word. Digital studio work. OK, just before the S of studio is what I'm looking for now. Rotate backwards. There's the L. And there's the S. So once again, let's drop the new locate point down. Now, using those two edit points, I'm going to go to track, cut. Now, let's see if we can, we can do with the BS-880 what's normally done with razor blades and sticky tape. Track, cut. Which tracks do I wish to cut? Well, it's track one, virtual track one. Yes. Start point, end point. Track cut, OK. Yes. Well, let's see if it's worked. Let's go back to the beginning of the phrase. You are listening to the latest breakthrough from Roland, the VS-880 Studio Workstation. Not bad. When scrubbing, the display shows an amplitude profile. It's actually a waveform diagram. And it's possible to preview to the selected edit point using the button marked 2. 880 digital. And from it. Studio workstation. So you can check the edit, the point of edit, once it's been done. And by holding down both buttons, you can listen through the studio edit workstation. 880 digital studio workstation. Like that. OK. To stop scrub, we simply press the stop button down here. And you can see on the display a vertical line running across the screen. Well, this represents the now time position. It's the now time cursor. And it shows exactly where this time location is. Anything that passes through this vertical line is what's happening at that moment. So you can use this when scrubbing with your amplitude profile to see exactly where bass drum transients are, guitar transients, and so on. <laughs> The Effects Expansion Board for the BS-880 supplies us with two very high-quality stereo processors, and these can both be integrated into your mix. OK, well, you should have been supplied with a preset patch list showing three groups of effects patches, A, B, and User. Well, A and B contain 100 presets each, and the User group is an area where you can store your own customized versions of these patches. Well, to have a look at the the various patches available, we first go to Effect. And you can see here, under this button, we have Effect 1 and Effect 2. We have to make decisions relating to the effects, which are placed into each one of those effect modules. So let's take a look at Effect 1. Press the button, and you see Effect 1 parameter question mark. Confirm by pressing Yes, and we can then select one of the 200 patches available just by rotating the dial. Now, selection isn't confirmed until we press Enter. So let's go and find a basic reverb setting. There we go. A00 is reverb large hall. I'm going to select that. Now, the various parameters associated with this particular patch can be accessed by moving through with the parameter controls. If I step to the right, you can see all the various effects parameters there. Well, I'm going to leave you to uh, research these on your own. They're very clearly laid out in the manual. Now, in order to use the effects, you first have to decide how you're going to hook them up to the mixer section. OK, well, let's first select an effect. I'm going to try and place some reverb on another drum loop that I've got ready to go. So into effect one, parameter, yes. And select one of the reverb settings. Well, the very first patch, A00, is a large hall emulation. So this is an effect that's going to simulate the acoustics of a large hall. Confirm the selection by pressing yes. Now, let's play back the loop. Well, it's completely dry at the moment. So, I'm going to go into my mixer section. Shift, channel edit 7 gives me access to effect 1 routing. And you can see it displays effect 1 off. Well, by rotating the value dial, I can select from pre-fade, send, post-fade, send, or insert. Now, 
each of the patches on the effects board are designed as either loop effects, that is either pre or post send effects, or as insert effects. And there's a, a distinct difference between the two. The general rule is the, the time domain effects, such as reverb, delay, flanging, chorus, phasing, and so on, tend to rely on having a component of the direct signal working alongside the effect. So the idea is you can send a small proportion of any one of the eight playback tracks to this effect. Imagine you've chosen reverb, for example. You can send a little bit of track one to the reverb unit, a bit more of track two, perhaps nothing on track three, perhaps it's the bass part, and so on, giving each track its own separate reverb send level. And to do this, we select either pre or post fade send. Well, let's select in this case post fade send. What this means is that as I increase the level of track one for the drum loop, it will increase the amount of level sent to the reverb unit. Okay. Moving one step to the right, I can actually change the amount of send. So let's set this to zero to start with. I'll play back the track and I'll increase the reverb send level. And you can hear that the sound gets wetter and wetter. Well, let's just back that off. Increase. And so on. Now, supposing I'd selected pre-fade send. Well, this means that the reverb sound is sent to independently of the fader position. So once again, I can start the track. And this time, what I'll do is fade out the direct signal component, just leaving the effect sound. This is very useful when trying to create distant sounds, particularly useful on vocals. OK. Effect one, send level. Well, that's what I want to control. But this time, I'm using pre-fade send. Effects at maximum. Remove the direct signal, but you still hear the reverb sound. OK, well, that's an example of a loop effect. Now, suppose we want to try something else. An insert effect would be something like compression or EQ or anything that requires the whole of the direct signal to be processed. And when you insert an effect on a particular channel, it means it can't be utilized by any of the other channels. So if I choose to compress track one, it means that I can't compress any of the other channels. Okay. Well, in this case, channels one and two have been linked to create channel A. And whenever an insert effect is selected for a linked pair, you automatically get stereo in, stereo out processing. So let's try compressing the drum loop in this case. So instead of pre-fade, I'm going to select insert. Go back to my effects one module and select compressor. Somewhere around here. There we go. There's the compressor. Select. And by switching insert and off, you will be able to hear the sound as it's compressed. OK, play back the loop. That's without. And that's with. And I can go to the compression amount whilst the track is still playing back by going into the parameter pages. Let's just change the, uh, the threshold. Bring it right down and then increase the compressor level. OK, a really compressed drum part. And don't forget, the, uh, the two effect modules are completely independent. So we can set up effect two to do exactly the same job as effect one if we need more channels of processing. For example, if we've already compressed on the inserts channels one and two as a stereo pair, we can use effect two to compress three and four quite independently. Or we can use it to do a completely different job. So having set a bit of reverb on the drum loop, let's now go and put a flanger onto the same channels but using the effect two module. Effects two parameters. Let's look for flange. There we go, deep flange. Select it, and then over to effects two routing in the mixer. This is shift channel edit eight. Insert the flanger. You may find that you have to modify some of the preset patches in order to get just what you want from the effects unit. And if you find you're constantly having to make the same changes to the reverbs or compressors or whatever they happen to be, you might like to store your favorite settings into a user memory location. 
and we have 100 memory locations available. So let me show you how you do that. Well, I've selected here for effect one, reverb large hall, and I've made some modifications to the various parameters shown over here. If I keep moving to the right, eventually I find the name of this particular effects patch, and I'm going to modify it. I'm going to call it Rev1. There we go. And get rid of all the other characters in the name just by scrolling around to a blank character. And so on. Once that's done, I scroll one step to the right and the screen prompts save user patch question mark. Well, I do want to save it, so I press yes. And then it asks me to select a target memory area. Well, I have a choice. I can choose from user zero all the way up to user 99. So let's store it in user 99. Press yes, and it says complete. And now, whenever I boot up the VS880, that particular customized patch will always be in user memory location 99. So I can call it up at any point. The VS880 contains eight independent scene memories into which can be stored a snapshot of all of the mixer settings and effect settings at any time. So what we do is set up a mix with independent level, pan, status, and effects routings, as well as effects parameters, and press one of these buttons down here. Now, we saw earlier that these were used for locate points, but they have a dual function. When the scene indicator is lit, they become snapshot buttons or scene buttons. And by pressing any one of them, I immediately store the mixer and effects settings. And I can recall those settings at any time just by pressing this button. Now, you can see that when we're in the scene mode, the display automatically reverts to the virtual image of fader and pan pop positions. So let's experiment. Let's create a mixer scene over here. And if you look at the display, remember the shape. I'm going to now store that scene into scene memory number one. Now I'll change the mix. Let's try altering some of the pan pots. And store this mix in scene two. Now if I revert to scene one, you can see on the display that all of the fader positions move. And that is actually what's happened internally, although the physical position of the faders does not change. And we can see here that the, the flashing horizontal lines indicate the real position of the faders and pan pots. And we can take over by moving any one of these controls. As soon as we move a fader, the internal value, if you like, of that level snaps to the, the new value assigned. And should you need to clear a scene memory, simply hold down the clear button along with the relevant scene button. Now, since the scene stores not only all of the mixer settings, but all of the effects and the V-track assigned to each of the main tracks, it's the ideal tool for trying out mix ideas. You can set up a mix, store it in a scene memory, try a completely different mix with completely different effects. Once again, store in a different scene memory and experiment, compare the two. So a really, really handy tool. <laughs>
OK, well, by default, Multitrack 2 is selected. And that's the one I tend to use. And the quality really is fantastic. We're prompted, create new song, question mark. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Do you want to store the current song that you're working on? Well, I wasn't working on anything, so I'm going to press no. But if you have been working on something else up to that point, then you might like to save the song. Now working, and it creates the blank song for me. So all of the settings are initialized at this point. Now I've been working on a backing track here. See what you think. Well, I'm ready at this point to put down a guitar solo over the second section of the tune. So this is the basic recording procedure. I've got the output of my guitar plugged directly into input number one on the back of the VS880. Now, these inputs are of rather low impedance. They're designed to match the output of keyboard synthesizers and sound modules and things like that. For use with guitar, we need to be a bit careful. I'm OK because I'm using active pickups here, so I will not get any sound deterioration by driving a low impedance input. But if you're using a passive guitar, you might consider plugging it into a DI box first, or maybe even a, a standard boss pedal with the effect switched off, as this will serve in the same way. OK, well, the first thing we have to do before we can record is set the input sensitivity for input number one. And we're going to rotate this dial here and play on the guitar as hard as we can until the peak LED just lights. And this shows at minus six dBs before clipping. So that's right. OK, now we have to route input number one to the track on which we're going to record, which in this case is track seven. So shift, channel edit number one, which shows a shift operation for input bus routing. Then select the channel you want to route to, which in this case is channel 7. And you can see there the various input options. Well, I'm going to set it to input number 1. OK? Press play to come out of that mode. At this stage, you can see that the status LED on channel 7 is showing green, which corresponds to playback of that track, as denoted by the key down here. If we want to monitor the input source for that channel, we have to switch this to an orange color. We should now hear the guitar if we play. Which we do. That's great. OK. Well, there's one last thing to do before I can drop into record, and that's select my guitar sound. Using one of the onboard COSM-based guitar amplifier simulations, I'm going to create the sound of a mic'd up rock stack guitar. So into effect one. And you can hunt around for various guitar amplifier simulations in here. But I've got one already set up on user 00, which is just here. I'm going to select it. And I'm then going to insert the amplifier simulator over the channel. OK? Effect 1, insert. And at this point, I should hear the amplifier simulation. Great. OK? into the play mode. I'm going to put track 7 into record ready. And I can do this either by rotating through the various status conditions, or I can go straight to it by pressing record and status at the same time. A red LED flashes, showing that we're in record ready mode. I'll start the track playing back, and I'll hit the record button just before I want to record the solo. Let's go in now. And stop the track. Let's just rewind a bit and make sure I did actually record something. Well, it's there all right. I'm not happy with the take, though. I've got a choice here. I could press the undo button over here and get rid of the recording altogether. Alternatively, I could switch now track 7 from track 7 virtual track 1 to track 7 virtual track 2, record another take, and then further takes all the way up to 8 guitar takes, and then find the best bits of each and edit them all together. Really, really handy way of using the virtual tracks. It means I don't ever have to worry about recording over old takes. 
it's possible to drop into record on the fly as the track is playing back. And we can use this to correct mistakes, say, within a guitar solo. So what I'm going to do is mark out an in point and an out point as the track is playing. And I'm then going to use the auto punch in mode to drop in at those points. So using locate one and two, I'll isolate in and out points. So I want to correct from here to here. OK. Now, holding down the auto punch button, pressing locate one for the in point, locate two for the out point, without releasing the auto punch button, I can then input those two values. Switch auto punch on by pressing it once again. The indicator will light back to the beginning of the solo. Press play and record. The record light will flash, showing this that we're ready to go into record, but we're not actually in record at that moment. And as soon as this locate point is reached, we will drop in automatically. So. Now you notice when we dropped out, there was a small gap there, just as you would expect to find on a traditional analog tape machine. But when we rewind, the gap will have disappeared. It will be a seamless join. Let's check it out. And that's how you use the auto punch in. When we record into the VS880, what we're actually recording onto the drive is the dry sound of the input signal coming in here. You can imagine the drive being at this point here. So the point of recording is just after the input. All of the effects and EQ are applied to the recorded material. They're not actually recorded themselves. We can change this. But let me first isolate the, the raw guitar part that I just put down. So I'm going to mute all the other channels. And I'm going to set up loop playback of a small section. If I now go to my FX1 processor and have a look at my selection, that's my guitar amp, but I can change that now and experiment with the different amplifier simulations available. Let's try the one on A52. This is a jazz chorus amp. Or a clean twin. Vintage tweed. So I can even save my, my decision as to the amplifier type until after the recording has been made. However, this could present a problem. It ties up the processor for a start. We're using the whole of the effects one section just to produce the guitar sound. And it might be much nicer if we could record the entire sound in one go. Well, we can do that. We have to change the order of the recording process so that rather than just recording the dry input, the, the drive, if you like, sees not only the input, but also the EQ and the effects put on that input. OK? So to do this, we simply go to an, a parameter known as pre-insert EQ effect. And we find it just after the effect 2 routing control. So shift, channel edit 8, effect 2. One step to the right, and we see EQ effect pre-insert. If we switch this on, then we can do exactly the same thing, insert the effects in exactly the same way. But this time, the effect will be recorded to the disk drive, so that when we come back and listen to it, we can reset the effects and use them for completely different functions, but we'll still have captured the sound that was applied originally. Now, track bouncing is a technique that you're going to have to master in order to make the best use of the available playback tracks and the effects processors. The idea is that you can set up a playback mix using control over the individual track levels, panning, EQ, and effects, and record what you hear to two available playback tracks, in this case, seven and eight. So let's have a listen to my mix, and I'll solo each of the parts so you can hear what's being recorded. Into solo mode. Right, on tracks one and two, we have the, the drum loop. Three and four is an acoustic guitar. On five, we have the bass. And finally, on six, a synth pad. Well, I've already used effect one to provide me with overall reverb, and effect two is tied up compressing the bass part. So I've used up six tracks and my total effects processing capability. Well, I'm gonna free up all of these things by recording what I hear to seven and eight. So let's stop. 
I'm going to change the inputs now for 7 and 8. So Shift, Channel Edit 1 takes me into Input Bus Selection. Now, I've created a stereo pair out of 7 and 8 by linking the two together. So if I select Channel D, as it is now called, the input for this, I'm going to select as Mix. Rather than the standard input 1 and 2 or 3 and 4, I'm going to select Mix. So what we record onto 7 and 8 is effectively what we hear coming out of loudspeakers. Pull the faders down, because we don't need to hear what's being recorded on 7-8, since we're already monitoring the mix. Back to the beginning of the song. Record status puts us into record ready. I'm now going to press the record button and press play. And hopefully, we should record the entire mix directly onto 7 and 8. OK, well, I'm just going to check my metering. You can see here the level that's being recorded onto 7 and 8 pre-fade. Let's just stop that. Let's pull down these faders, back to the top of the song, 7 and 8 into playback ready, and hopefully we'll have printed all of those sounds directly to 7 and 8. There we go. Having performed the bounce down, I can now rewind to the beginning of the song and record over tracks 1 to 6 giving me, in fact, a total of 12 tracks. And I can repeat the process over and over again, going 6 to 2, record another 6, 6 to 2, record another 6. OK? So I have unlimited tracks, really, as well as unlimited effects processing. The way the signal is bounced down is all internal, and it's all done in the digital domain. So you never have to worry about quality traps. There's no degradation in the sound quality as you bounce from 6 to 2. Good way of working. Now, I love to use sampled drum loops, and I import them and try and put them together to create some composition. Take these three loops, for example. There's one. There's another. And finally, a, a guitar loop. Right, well, I'm going to try and take those three elements and put them together to create a song. Let's try putting the first two loops together. Well, there's a problem. You can hear that they're both running at different tempos. Well, the VS880 can perform a little bit of magic called time compression, which allows you to change the duration of a piece of music without changing its pitch. OK? So let's try speeding up the second loop just a little bit, making it a little bit shorter but without changing its pitch. It's only a slight change, but it makes all the difference, because the two samples will now work together, like this. It's amazing stuff. Now let's try adding the guitar loop. I don't think it's going to work. I think it was much too slow. Yeah. But remember the pitch of the guitar. We're now going to apply time compression and make it fit. Well, that's an amazing facility and very, very useful indeed. For me, it means I can utilize that huge resource, which is the, the sort of sample library that's normally only available for use by people with samplers. Now, anyone with a VS880 using time compression and expansion can import that data and make it work for them. OK, well, exactly how did I perform that time compression? So this is how I did it. I've taken both loops and placed them on tracks one and two, respectively. And they both start at exactly the same point as designated by locate one. And I got them to start at the same place by using the track move edit, which works just like track copy, except that rather than making a copy of a region, you're simply moving a region. But the parameters are the same. OK? Press locate one and start playback. OK, once again, the two loops run out of phase. Let's listen to each one separately. That's the first loop. And there's the second. Well, in order to match them up, we have to first mark out the end points of both loops. So for loop number one, I'm going to drop a locate point at the end of a four-bar section. Two, three, four. OK. And do the same for loop number two. Two, three. Four. 
OK, and it will be the difference between the positions of locate 2 and locate 3 that provide us with the information that we need to perform the compression. So let's leave 1 as it is, but change the duration of number 2 into track edit, compression, expansion. Question mark? Yes. Now, which track do we wish to compress or expand? Well, track 2, virtual track 1. The start point of the audio to be compressed. OK, well, we know that it's locate point number 1, because I defined that. The end point of the audio to be compressed. Well, it's locate 3, because that's the end point of the second loop. And where do we want the new ending for the second loop to go? Well, we want it to line up with the ending for the first loop. So that's locate point 2. Pitch mode, fixed. Well, it's possible to vary the pitch as well as the duration. That's just like speeding up a piece of tape. Now, the type of compression can be changed. We have settings A, B, or C. Well, pick type A if you're trying to compress or expand a piece of dialogue. Pick type C if you're trying to change the duration of a drum loop or anything rhythmic. And B is anything sort of in between the two. So I'm going to set that to C. OK, the amplitude. Well, sometimes when you're compressing or expanding, you'll find the overall perceived volume after time compression or expansion will have changed. And this can be set to compensate for that. OK, don't worry about it until you've performed the edit. And once you've done it, if you find the volume has dropped, then undo the edit, go back, and increase the amplitude level. Time compression expansion, OK. Now, as soon as I press the Yes button, it's going to start calculating for the compression. And this takes a couple of minutes. So it says, now working, and gives us a percentage. OK, it's complete. Well, let's try it. Amazing. Now, it's very important that you save your work at regular intervals, since any edits you make will only be stored permanently when you store the song. Well, let's first create the name for the song. Here we go. Song name protect. Hit yes, and we're now ready to customize the name. So let's call this VOM. Simply selecting the letters using the time value dial, and then moving along using the Enter button. There we go. And then I'm going to get rid of the other characters. Now to Song Save. And once you've named the song, you can then store it by holding down Shift and return to zero. And you can see the shift operation there is store. Store OK, question mark. Yes. And it says now working. And the song is stored. Now once you've finished recording your song, it's time to mix down. Now the mix down process is made a lot simpler by the onboard automation. And there are two types of automation available. There's a real-time automation and a snapshot automation. Well, let's check out the real-time automation. I've got eight tracks of recorded material here, and I'm going to go into auto mix mode by holding down the scene button and pressing the mixer mode button. And you can see that the indicator will flash. In the top left-hand corner of the display, we see the play condition. At the moment, this is set to play, but if I hold scene and record, it moves to play mix. We're now ready to record the position of the faders and pan pots as I move them. So, pressing play now. Changing the mix in real time. Press stop, and you can see the display shows now working complete. It's simply recorded any of the fader or pan movements that I just made. Back to the top of the track. Play back the track, and you should see and hear the changes. Amazing. The auto mix is put together using the marker points here. You can see 0, 063 asterisk. Well, any, any marker that is used as part of the auto mix process has an asterisk beside it. And I can move through these 
just as they were standard marker points. Well, let me now erase the auto mix that I just recorded by getting rid of all the marker points. Now, the quickest way of doing that is to hold down Shift and Clear and press Tap at the same time. And the display shows Clear All Markers? Question mark. Yes, and that gets rid of the auto mix completely. Okay, well, there's an alternative way of using the auto mix, and that's using snapshots instead of a real time mix. To do this, let's first go to the top of the track and set a mix. It sounds like this. Well, let's suppose that's exactly the mix I want. I'm going to drop down a scene snapshot by holding down the button marked scene and pressing tap. And immediately we see marker zero asterisk. This shows us that we've dropped an auto mix marker at that point. OK, well, let's now move to the beginning of the verse, which I've also marked out here with locate two. I'm going to change the mix. And you can see the display shows my new mix. Press stop. Now, as soon as you press stop when you're in auto mix mode, the mix reverts to the last selected marker. So what I have to do now, go to the head of the verse, and then just touch each of the faders a little bit. And what this does is it, it resets the fader positions to the physical positions of the faders as they are at this point. Once that's done, I can then drop another scene marker. And there we go. I've created two different static auto mix positions. And I can scroll between them like this. And you can see on the display, two different mixes are shown. One for the verse, one for the beginning of the song. Let me explain what the alternative mixer modes are about. So far, we've been working in input track mode, which gives us an eight channel desk working with eight tracks of playback. We can reconfigure the mixer to give us 14 inputs, however. To do that, we hold down Shift and Mixer Mode. And we can then toggle between two different views of input mix and track mix. Well, firstly, track mix. Just as before, we set up a mix for the eight playback tracks, and the display shows us the mix. Now, the faders are dual duty in this case, because we can switch to an input mix display and reconfigure a mix for six audio inputs, inputs one, two, three, and four, plus the digital stereo input here. OK, so what it means we can do is play back the eight recorder tracks in conjunction with six audio inputs. Very, very useful when we run the VS880 along with a MIDI sequencer playing back sounds from external MIDI sound modules. It means we can incorporate the audio produced by them into our mix down. And, of course, the automation works in input mix as well as track mix modes. It's possible to synchronize the playback of the VS880 to any external MIDI sequencer or drum machine. And to do this, we use a special kind of MIDI message called MIDI clock. Well, this is a very neat way of working because it means we can use the sequencer plus sound modules to produce all of the synth-based backing track and record all the real instruments onto the VS880 tracks. Well, how have I hooked the two together? I've taken a MIDI cable from MIDI out on the VS880 to MIDI in on the Roland XP80 over here. And I'm going to use the VS880 as the master device, slaving the XP80 to it. Well, I've got my backing track pre-prepared here. Just let me play it to you. Simple bass drums and keyboard pad. Well, that's free running at the moment. What I'm going to do is play the guitar part that I've recorded on the VS880 separately, just so you can hear it. Simple power chords, and these were recorded playing along to the built-in metronome. Well, it is the tempo map which will be used to generate the MIDI clock information. So, first thing I need to do is set the XP80 to slave. And this means I can start and stop it from the VS880. But before that will work, I need to make one or two other settings. Go to the system edit condition button and to sync tempo. Look for syn gen, synchronization generate. At the moment, the VS880 is not generating any kind of sync code at all. We could set it to MIDI time code, but we, we can't use this since the XP80 will not respond to that. We're going to use MIDI clock instead. OK? And that should be all we have to do. If I now press play on the VS880, both the guitar part and the MIDI sequence data should play in concert.
there we go, it works very well. And you may notice that the sound of the guitar and the sound of the XP80 were faded out by No Master Fader here. Well, that's because I've taken the audio outputs from the XP80 and routed them back into the VS880. Using inputs one and two, I've assigned them to the stereo in facility. To find that, if you go to the master channel edit, you can see stereo in. Well, this allows us to mix in, if you like, a stereo pair. And I've chosen inputs one and two for that job, but I could just as well choose three and four or the digital inputs. You may have noticed when setting up the sync parameters that there was an alternative option as far as the sync code was concerned. We used MIDI clock, but we could have chosen MTC. Well, this stands for MIDI time code. Now, there's a, a big difference between the two types of code. MIDI clock is a tempo-related code, and you find you have 24 MIDI messages per quarter note. So as the tempo speeds up, you'll get more messages in a given time. MIDI time code, however, is the MIDI equivalent of SIMT code, and simply gives information relating to the position during a song in terms of hours, minutes, seconds, frames, and so on. Now, the VS880 will not lock to incoming MIDI clock, but it will lock to incoming MIDI time code, as is common with hard disk recorders these days. So if you want to lock the VS880 to another VS880, we need to use MTC to do the job. Simply select on one machine, sync generate MTC, and on the other, set to external sync, and it will read incoming MTC and lock to it. Provided, that is, that you've set the frame rates to be identical. The default is 30 frames a second. So just ensure that both machines are using 30 frames per second MTC. And you should find then that by operating the transport controls on the master device, you can slave a second device at the same time. And the two will remain playing back in sync. We spoke earlier about the non-destructive nature of the VS880's editing system. This means that every time we make an edit, the original is kept intact. Well, this is also true when we're making recordings. Every time we record, go back, re-record, the takes are stacked up, OK? This eventually uses up space off the drive. Should you wish to get rid of all of the edit history, once you've decided what you've got is what you want, you can optimize the song. To do that, we go to Song Optimize. Song optimize OK, yes, optimize sure, optimize really. So we have to be sure. Now working. So this strips away all of the available undo levels. So make sure before you optimize the song, you're absolutely certain that what you've got is what you want. When you finish working with the VS880, it's important to shut it down in the correct way. To do that, we hold down Shift and shut eject down here. Shut eject, question mark, yes. Do we wish to store current? Do we want to store what we've been working on up to this point? Well, I'm going to press yes. It stores the current song and then asks you to please wait as it shuts down. Now, this gives the, the heads on the drive an opportunity to park themselves. It's not a very good idea to just to switch off the power when you finish working. And in the olden days, this could have caused problems with the disk drive, such as a disk crash. Once it's finished its power down routine, it gives you the option to switch off or restart. So I'm going to switch off. One of the more unusual effects on the board is the 19-band vocoder. It's a very processor-hungry effect. So when you're using this, you only get access to one of the effects modules. But this is how it works. I'm going to vocode the guitar directly from a microphone. I've taken the guitar and plugged it directly into input one and the microphone into input two. Inputs one and two are up and are showing orange source monitor. And I've linked the two. So channel link is on for one and two. Across, I've inserted the vocoder effect. Effect one, insert vocoder. OK, now using this old headset microphone, I can play the guitar and vocode the guitar directly. Brilliant effect. Another very interesting effect is the voice transformer. Again, this 
uses up so much processing that we only have access to the one effect. But it's an amazing effect. It does what's known as formant corrected pitch shifting and allows independent control over the pitch of a vocal as well as its characteristics. Now, the characteristics are known as formants, and they basically determine the size of the vocal cords. And it means we can take a recording of a female and change the gender to male or vice versa. For example, back to that piece of dialogue we used earlier. You are listening to the latest breakthrough from Roland, the VS880 Digital Studio Workstation. OK, rewind that, but change the gender of the sound using the VT1. Exactly the same recording, but processed. You are listening to the latest breakthrough from Roland, the VS880 Digital Studio Workstation. Amazing, isn't it? Let's go and have a look at the controls. Into Effect 1 parameters. And here we go. Control over the pitch and the format independently. And we can bring these controls out onto the first four faders of the mixer section. Fader Edit On. You are listening to the latest breakthrough from Roland, and you can see here, control over the VS-880 is the pitch world's first fully integrated digital and audio facility to incorporate a digital audio completely independently. 14-channel digital mixer. Well, it's great fun, but it has practical application as well. It's perfect for isolating those slightly flat notes in a vocal performance and just pitching them up just enough to make the performance good. Okay, once you've done that, you can bounce that across and integrate it into the original take. Most commercial recordings these days rely to a certain extent on compressing the overall mix at the mastering stage. It lends a professional sound to the recording. Well, we can do exactly that with the VS880. Instead of inserting the effect onto each of the playback tracks, we insert it into the master strip. So go to Effect 1 and select your effect. Let's go for the compressor at A66. Select it, and now go to your master channel edit and look for Effect 1 Insert Switch. Well, at the moment it's off, but if I switch it to on, we can insert the stereo compressor over the overall mix. There we go. Bit too much compression there, but gives you the idea. Let's suppose we're working with a piece of audio like this. Now, at this stage, we have no way of knowing what the tempo of that loop is, but we can calculate it using tap markers. Well, the tune starts at five, so what I'm going to do is tap out in time with the music, okay, giving four bars intro. Drop markers using the tap button. One, two, three, four. Okay, well, I just dropped 16 there. I'm going to go back and use those markers to calculate a new tempo map based on the the rate at which I dropped them. OK, into system. Find sync tempo and all the way along until we see sync track convert and press yes. Now, we're going to go for tap to tempo map. And it asks us what our pulse was. Well, we were in 4-4 time and the tap beat was 4 beats per bar. Overwrite tempo? Yes. Complete. And now we should have a tempo map that starts at the beginning of the tune. Watch and see if the measure and beat display lines up with the onset of the tune. And amazingly, it does. Let's imagine that you've been working on a complicated MIDI sequence that involves a lot of tempo changes. Well, you decide you want to hook up to the VS880 in order to overdub the guitar parts. But unfortunately, the VS doesn't know the tempo map that you've created in the sequencer. But it doesn't matter, because you can set the VS to learn the MIDI tempo map created within the sequence. What you do is you hook up MIDI out from the sequencer to MIDI in on the VS880, and then Go to Sync Tempo, and we're going to try and find Sync Track Record, question mark. Press Yes, and it says Waiting for Start. If you now press Play on your MIDI sequencer, the VS880 will record the MIDI clock information coming in and will generate its own internal tempo map 
based on what it sees. We can then rewind, reconnect the MIDI cables so that now we have MIDI out from the VS going to MIDI in on the sequencer and use the VS-880 as the master device, but controlling the sequencer from a sync track which was originally generated by the sequencer. Clever stuff. Now backup is a very important issue when we're talking about hard disk recording systems. I would recommend that every time you finish working on a song, you make a duplicate of that song, storing it to an external SCSI device. Now you can see here, I'm using the iOmega zip drive. This is connected to the VS880 using the SCSI port on the back of the unit. And in this case, we have a SCSI chain involving two units. I could actually connect up more than one external drive if I wanted to, but for my purposes, one drive is fine. These are the zip disks. Each one of these can hold up to 100 megabytes of data. So I can store maybe three or four of my songs on one of these. Well, briefly talking about SCSI chains. When your drive's hooked up, be sure to switch the external drive on before the VS880 as it needs to see an active drive when performing its SCSI scan during boot up. Also, on the back of the drive, you'll notice something called termination. Well, assuming you've only got one drive in the chain, the terminator must be switched on. If you're using two drives, then simply engage termination for the last drive in the chain. Any SCSI device within a chain has what's known as an ID number. Okay? Rather like using MIDI channels, we have SCSI IDs. And the VS880 has its own self-ID, and this is set by default to ID number 7. On the back of my zip drive, I have a choice of ID number 5 or ID number 6. If I was using two zip drives, I would select 5 for one of the drives, 6 for the other. And this way, the VS880 can identify them and write to them separately. OK, well, I'm going to plug my zip disk in. To store my currently selected song, this is the procedure. The first thing I do, assuming this is a new zip disk, is initialize the disk, format it, if you like. And to do that, we go to System, and we look for Drive Initialize. Press Yes. Now, be very careful at this point, because it says Initialize Drive IDE 0. Well, that's the internal drive. And the last thing I want to do is, is initialize that drive. Otherwise, I'll lose all my data. So I'm going to select SC5, SCSI Device ID 5. Press Yes. Initialize SCSI 5 OK. Yes. Sure. Yes. Store current. No. And it says now working. And after a few seconds, you will see a percentage of completion of the zip disk that I've just inserted. Disk has now been initialized. I'm now going to make a copy of the currently selected song and place it onto that drive. And to do that, we go to Song Copy. It says Copy Mode, Playable. Well, I have a choice here. I can copy my song as a playable file. That means if I select the zip drive as my current drive, I can play back the song directly from it. Alternatively, I can use archive mode. Now, supposing I'm trying to back up the whole of my internal drive. Well, this is, this is a, quite a large capacity, and the zip, as I've explained, only holds 100 megabytes. What I can do using archive is use maybe 10 or 12 zip disks to back up the entire content.